can you all believe that Leslie Jameson and Mary motherfucking Carr are here with me tonight? I also just want you to know that Mary is in Antigua and Leslie is in LA. So I'm just so grateful to the two of you, uh, two of my favorite writers and favorite people and friends. Um, it's such an honor to be launching this book with you, whose personal writing has meant so much to me. Um, oh God, I already feel like I'm gonna cry. <laughs> um, and I'm also so grateful to Books Are Magic. I just spent today, I moved to Iowa almost two years ago and I haven't been back since then. And I've just been walking around Brooklyn in the sun, like signing books and seeing friends. Um, yes, wearing overalls like a middle-aged toddler. Um, and my heart is already so full. I'm truly like already crying. So I'm just gonna read from this book. Um, and I don't know, I just, um, I've been a teacher for almost as long as I've been a writer. And uh, this book came out of both of those experiences. Um, and I'm just gonna read a little bit from the first chapter in the book and I'm gonna skip around some. And there's a bunch of stuff about Freud and hysteria and testimony. And I'm not gonna read all of the, that stuff. I'm just gonna read so you get the sort of uh, marrow of it. Okay, this um, chapter is called In Praise of Navel Gazing. In a recent nonfiction workshop I taught, a female student cringed when I suggested she include more of her own story in an essay. The narrative experimented with form and suggested a history of sexual trauma, but quickly shifted into the more lyrical and analytical musing on the general subject. She frowned. I don't want to seem self-absorbed, you know, navel gazing. The rest of the room, nearly all women, nodded. This is a scene that has played out everywhere I have taught writing, at colleges of all sizes, conferences, and private salons. It is a concern I have heard from countless students and peers, and which I have often greeted with a combination of bafflement and frustration. Since when did telling our own stories and deriving their insights become so reviled? It doesn't matter if the story is your own, I tell them over and over, only that you tell it well. Should we not always tell stories so that their specificity reveals some larger truth? And yet, how many times have I been privy to conversations among other writers in which we sneer at the very concept? We compulsively assure each other that writing isn't about enacting a kind of therapy. How gross. We are intellectuals. We are artists. I mean, you can't expect people to be interested in your diary, a friend and fellow teacher exclaimed once. I nodded. What kind of monstrous narcissist would make that mistake? So before I read this next little passage, I just want to thank my mother, who is a psychotherapist, who introduced me to the work of James Pennebaker. I don't know if she's here, but thank you, mom, for this and many other things. In the 1980s, social psychologist James Pennebaker conducted some now famous studies on his theory of expressive writing. Pennebaker instructed participants in his experimental group to write about a past trauma, expressing their very deepest thoughts and feelings surrounding it. In contrast, control participants were asked to write as objectively and factually as possible about neutral topics without revealing their emotions or opinions. For both groups, the schedule was 15 minutes of continuous writing repeated over four consecutive days. Some of the participants in the experimental group found the exercise upsetting. All of them found it valuable and meaningful. Monitoring over the subsequent year revealed that those participants made significantly fewer visits to physicians of all kinds. Pennebaker's research has since been replicated many times and his results supported. Expressive writing about trauma strengthens the immune system, decreases obsessive thinking and contributes to the overall health of the writers. And this is after only four days of 15 minute sessions. Pennebaker has since written extensively about how this effect can also be consistent on a much larger scale in communities who have suffered the atrocities of war. The articulation of painful memories, including the literature and art that arises out of political upheaval is integral to the formation, preservation and integration of collective memory. Let's face it, if you write about your wounds, it is likely to be therapeutic. Of course, the writing done in those 15 minutes was surely terrible by artistic standards, but it is a logical fallacy to conclude that any writing with therapeutic effect is terrible. You don't have to be into therapy to be healed by writing. Being healed does not have to be your goal. 
but to oppose the very idea of it is nonsensical, unless you consider what such a bias reveals about our values as a culture. Knee-jerk bias backed by flimsy logic and pseudoscience has always been a preferred disguise of our national prejudices. That these topics of the body, the emotional interior, the domestic, the sexual, and the relational are all undervalued in intellectual literary terms and are all associated with the female spheres of being is not a coincidence. That is, Carl Nosgaard is a genius, a risk taker for his chronicles of the domestic, while all my female graduate students are terrified to write about being mothers for fear that they will be deemed or already are vacuous narcissists. Those who benefit from the inequities of our society resist the stories of people whose suffering is in large part owed to the structures of our society. They do not want to have to change. We see this in a thousand forms of white fragility, male fragility, and transphobic and homophobic tantrums, protesting the ground gained by trans and queer storytellers. The resistance to memoirs about trauma is in many respects a reiteration of the classic role of perpetrator, to deny, discredit, and dismiss victims in order to avoid being implicated or losing power. Anyone who writes the story of their individual trauma, and especially those of identities that have been historically oppressed and abused, is subject to the re-traumatization by ongoing perpetrators, the patriarchal white supremacist colonizing nation in which they must live and learn to heal. Social justice has always depended upon the testimonies of the oppressed. It is not enough for the people of such identities to cast off shame and demand justice. The listeners must join them. And for that, we need to hear their stories. I don't mean to argue that writing personally is for everyone. What I'm saying is don't avoid yourself. The story that comes calling might be your own and it might not go away if you don't open the door. I don't believe in writer's block. I only believe in fear and you can be afraid and still write something. No one has to read it, though when you're done, you might want them to. One of the epigraphs of my second book, though it could be an epigraph for my life, is a quote from the British psychoanalyst D.W. Winnicott. It is joy to be hidden and disaster not to be found. Almost everything I've ever written started with a secret, with the fear that my subject was unspeakable, Without exception, writing about these subjects has not only freed me from that fear, but from the subjects themselves and from the bondage of believing I might be alone in them. What I have also observed is that avoiding a secret subject can be its own kind of bondage. Transforming my secrets into art has transformed me. I believe that stories like these have the power to transform the world. That is the point of literature, or at least that's what I tell my students. We are writing the history that we could not find in any other book. We are telling the stories that no one else can tell, and we are giving this proof of our survival to each other. Thank you so much for listening um, and for coming tonight. Um, I am so honored by your presence here. Um, Mary and Leslie, hi, friends. Hey, Melissa. So beautiful to hear you read from this book. It's really, it's such a necessary, moving, everything manifesto to Thank the you. thing we do and you do so beautifully. It's really a miracle. Such an honor to be yeah. here. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I am interested. So sort of selfishly, I have questions for both of you because while we've had many conversations, we've never, we don't really talk about writing in this way, you know? Um, you mean, except for when I made you read my book and tell me how to make it. Except for when you gave me the enormous <laughs> privilege of reading your genius book that everyone will get to read soon enough. Splinters, mark your calendar. Oh, no, no, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> We're gonna ask you questions. <laughs> Um, okay, so I guess I just want to know, like, I've been talking with, um, doing some one-off workshops and talking with students, and especially about sort of the voices that are in our heads when we're writing that are trying to make us stop, and sort of how important the work of learning to write through those voices and despite those voices, and I guess I'm just wondering if both or either of you could talk about sort of what your voices say. I think of them as trolls, like not online trolls, but like under the bridge trolls that are like, don't go this way, you know? 
Um, and I'm wondering your strategies and how you've sort of learned to write through them because you're both incredibly prolific and write searingly intimate work. And I know, know that you're probably not exempt from that kind of hurdle. So anything you can speak to that. I, I read Melissa Phoebos. I mean, one of the great things about body work and one of the thrilling things um, about reading in a manuscript was getting to share that opening essay in praise of navel gazing, which is uh, already in print in the world uh, with my graduate students um, before the book came out. And, uh, you know, I, I talked to other uh, people, a lot, lot of women, Amy Tan, you know, you guys, uh, I feel like I'm blessed with, uh, smart, brave women in my life. Um, I'm a big one on a hot bath. I'm a big one. I'm a big one on a nap. Uh, I think a sandwich is what keeps me more often than not from shooting myself or, or anybody else. So, um, that gun, you need a sandwich. <laughs> put down that gun. You need a, you need a sandwich, but, but what do you do, Leslie? What are you, how do you, um, well, the only way I know to do it is write through it and delete it. I don't know how to not do it. Yeah, I think, I mean, first of all, you put it so beautifully when you talk about those voices, Melissa, and I think it's so great to put that in the room and to hear you speak to it, Mary, because I think they're, you know, sometimes I feel like almost when students come to me with these questions about their own voices, like why does, you know, why does this, why would anybody care about this experience that I've had? Hasn't this story been told a million times before? My life isn't extraordinary enough to justify its, you know, writing as nonfiction, all those things. It's almost like they're saying, I know you don't have to deal with these thoughts anymore, but this is what I'm thinking. It's like, no, 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 like it's all there. So it's such a perfectly encapsulated question. And your book is, I totally agree with Mary, is so part of why it just felt like oxygen to inhale your book was that it's so beautifully crystallized and articulated like the doubts and the shame and some ways of moving through them and felt like god i'm so glad this just exists on earth i mean i think for me the two two things that i do when i feel the voices are like read deeply personal writing with which I, without which I could not imagine existing in the same way. And to be like, I feel so fucking grateful that this exists. Both of your writing exists in this way for me as just like, but the world feels bigger and more possible because this exists. And I can believe in that 100% in a way that I can't believe in the thing I'm putting on my laptop at that moment, but I can, stand behind the aspiration that it might feel to somebody else the way this text feels to me. Mm. And then I think also like just thinking about what I value aesthetically on a craft level, like I value particularity and I value being right there in a scene. And so when I feel myself being like, why would anybody fucking want to read about this fight? I'm just going to summarize it and make it sound lyrical and talk about going out to buy cigarettes at four in the morning. And then my editor's like, no, no, no give us the dialogue of your hopelessly banal argument. And I'm like, oh yeah, I believe in specificity. So I guess if I believe in specificity, I have to sit down and do that work even when I feel like ah, I want to explode from the shame of getting specific about this. So I don't know, but it's such a great question. How would, I mean, in a way it's like you've just written a book about it, but like, what do you do process wise, Melissa, when you're facing that stuff and you're sitting down to work? Yeah, some of, first of all, I just want to say that um, ever since I saw because I, I am constantly harping on specificity with my students also. And ever since I read your draft and I saw the picture of the cake that your students got you, that was like, be more specific or whatever. I, I now, it flashes in my mind every time I say the word specific or specificity in my classroom. So thank you for that. Um, all those many thoughts of cake. Uh, I do the same thing. And one of my, one of the things that my sort of uh, trolls say, uh, is one of the things that you mentioned, which is, oh, this has been done before, or like, this has been done by you, 
Melissa before. <laughs> like you're only allowed to write about it one time. There's only allowed to be one story of a female drunk or like someone who was abused in this way, or you're only allowed to write one book about spanking stockbrokers. You can't ever mention it again. And you already got 300 pages. You know what I mean? <laughs> Cause no, I, it's, I'm so terrified of people being like, oh, there she goes again, talking about shooting heroin or whatever, you know? And then I do the thing that you just described where it's like, I think, make a list in my mind of the books I love, including your, both of your books, multiple books to do both of yours and so many others. And I'm like, if it's already been done before, then we must need these books over and over and over because the alcoholics never stop coming, right? Like, um, there are plenty of people still doing sex. You know what I mean? Like there are people having these experiences over and over and over again. And I needed those stories over and over, just like hammered into my consciousness. And so I'm just like adding to the chorus, you know, like I don't have to do something no one's done before. I'm just repeating the thing that needs repeating. Right. Also, if you think I was thinking about, as I was reading body work about the the last generation of great white guy, uh, great white guy writers. Lord God, let it be the last. But um, no, but I mean, Philip Roth was a good friend of mine. Saul Bellow, Updike, all those white guys in New York. And um, it's all about who they're boning. It's all about their adultery. And uh, they never worried about repeating themselves about, you know, the, the you know, the next Bambi they were going to bid. So exactly. Can you imagine any, any of those guys being like, wait a minute, those other guys wrote about cheating on their wives. I can't do it. <laughs> Who will care? <laughs> and you know, and I think one of the things that I so appreciated about your book, Melissa, was that it just gets straight at what can sometimes feel like the elephant in the room, but certainly shouldn't, which is just like the role that gender plays in all this, right? Like, the magazine editor saying, well, like, didn't you tell a version of your birth story before? Like, I had spent that cash and it couldn't be in my wallet anymore. Like, you know, is probably not saying, well, like, didn't you write about being a soldier before? You know, it's like the sort of which experiences get seen as, you know. Right. The... Didn't you write about being a Russian count before? <laughs> 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 didn't you write about being a big, smart um, genius before? Did you that mention other, your that, penis that in that one time? short story? Wasn't your, dick in another, wasn't your dick in another novel? Am I wrong? Was that, is this the same dick? I, I... <laughs> is this the same dick? I'm going to get t-shirts made for us. <laughs> But then back just says yes. Yep. <laughs> so good. Oh my God. Thank you so much. Um, so can I ask then, as um, I know both of you, all three of us are creative writing professors too. Like, are you hearing this stuff from your students as much as I am where they're like, oh no, I'm really trying to move away from autobiographical writing or like I've, progressed to whatever it is that they're writing then or um, I'm writing about history and time now <laughs> that's right <laughs> that's you written it's really gonna yeah, I mean, that's it I mean my my famous story of being the only woman in a Harvard writing group was the when I was pregnant the guy said I hope you're not going to be one of those women who writes about about her baby and I said what would you like it was Sven Burkert's I said okay Sven what would you like me to write about he said, history or time. I, said, and I, I pointed to my big bloated belly and I said, this is history. This, God this damn is right. time. With it, this is time, buddy. Without, without this, there's no you, so bucko. I mean, who understands time more than pregnant women, Sven? Truly, you know? Totally. Or like, I'm going to write about this time that we're having in this room right now. And this question no. just asked me. Like, having to pee. What, what pregnant woman who doesn't I have know. to pee? Oh, God, that makes me think of that passage in, in Splinters, Leslie, with the breast pumping in the office scene, which is just, oh, my God, I, I'm so jealous of everyone on this Zoom who hasn't read it yet because you get to read that scene for the first time when she just 
very, very gently slits a man's throat with her writing. <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> I know we'll see we'll see how gentle it, it plays out um yeah I mean I think you know one of the things I love about your book I mean my students say this all the time the kind of either the either they frame a sense of vulnerability or shame as like you know I feel self-conscious about writing this thing or I think they frame the same feeling of vulnerability and shame as oh no no I don't write about that you know but it's like to me those two things are sort of often they're coming from the same place which is like to write about the personal isn't as important isn't an ambitious isn't as ambitious so I'm either going to say that in a self-deprecating way or I'm going to say it in a oh no 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 that's not for me way and one of the things I love about your book, even we could hear it in the passages that you read out, is like you're constantly like digging underneath the motivations beneath certain kinds of dismissals. So not just digging underneath what what's happening when we dismiss the personal, but even within that, what happens when people who do personal writing dismiss certain ways of understanding that work, right? Like, oh no, no, it's not healing to, to yep. write. I mean, it's not heal. It's not therapeutic. It's not my diary. Like, and they're all kind of ways of avoiding that great pulsing feeling of like, but like, like what you say so beautifully with such like beautiful directness, which is like, yeah, what if actually writing is healing to do, to read, to, to put into the world? And like, what if we didn't have to kind of back away from that as some sort of negation of rigor? What if it could be rigorous and healing at once? Like what, you know, what if we weren't invested in these binaries? So yeah, I've started to think of it. Go ahead, Mayor. No, I was gonna say so gracefully in body work and in girlhood, I think as you talk about gender and history and ideas in a very seamless way, I don't feel like you're dragging in um, Sigmund Freud kicking and screaming to make your point. It's you're, you have a narrative based on emotional danger and often real physical risk, often mm -hmm. physical risk mm -hmm. and, and psychological risk. And, uh, and in the course of that, you also kind of, let your i mean the ideas are 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 not sort of stapled on to show how smart you are it's yeah. an organic part of your telling a story oh, and okay. uh, as it, don't you find i'm just going to ask both of you this don't you find that your students often they just go running for sequins and and uh fringe and gigaws and play pretties to mm -hmm super glue on top of their story mm -hmm. so that it's not just about gee i really got my heart yeah. stomped on by yep. my boyfriend slash mother slash yep yep i remember doing that myself i remember like all of the flourish and in like shoehorning things in that didn't belong there and it was just fear right like what it boiled down to was that i was afraid that I didn't have anything to say and that what I did have to say was unimportant, that it wasn't worth someone else's time. So better <laughs> that I write long, beautiful, boring, convoluted, like not ever saying the thing I came to say, like, God, you know, just please forgive me anyone that ever read any of my short stories in undergrad or graduate school, <laughs> because it was just like me running and hiding with weird opaque descriptions of things. So confusing. And I think, that's the thing that I find myself saying to my students a lot that like, if you've gotten this far, like the thing you have to say is a burning thing. Like if you are here in this classroom, if you've been doing it this long and to go back to what you were saying, Leslie, like writing is so fucking hard. Like if we don't have something to say and we're not getting something profound out of it, that is not attention from other people or like some kind of dry intellectual satisfaction, like, we wouldn't be doing it, you know? Like it has to be heart work or we just give up and do something easier that makes us more money. Like, why wouldn't we do that? <laughs> you know, like it has to be the thing that is healing us, that is transforming us, that is like bringing us to a different kind of understanding of things, right? How did you get the nerve to ask your students that you have that wonderful 
uh, thing in body work where you ask them to write about their sex lives and then you ask them to do it again. Can you describe that? Can you sort of explain yeah, that? Yeah, so I have this exercise and anyone, there's probably lots of people on this Zoom who have taken classes with me and at least one point in almost every semester, I have done an exercise. And in the book, I refer to it through the lens of sex, but sometimes I just do it as a life story. And I tell my students, write your life story in five sentences. And with the, in the essay about writing about sex, I say, write your sexual life story in five sentences. And then I actually do a countdown a lot of the time where I'm like, now write it in three, now write it in two, now write it in one, and never recycle any of the same material with the idea that there's like a superficial version of our story, the one we've been telling ourselves, the one that helped us survive. Like, I'm not I have a lot of reverence for that story, but when we sit down to write it, we're trying to get to a different, like deeper version of the story. And that by sort of drilling into it, it gets more and more unexpected and we get into places we haven't been before. Um, and I think if I hadn't been doing the like life story version of that exercise, I probably wouldn't have had the sexual life story version, but I'd done it so many times. I just, it's just, it wins every time, like it never not works, you know? Like people are always like, holy shit, I didn't even know that was in me when they get to the end of it. Um, so strong recommend, steal it, all the teachers in the room, like telling your life story in five sentences over and over again always works. I honestly, when I read that part of your book, I was like so excited by the very concept of that, that I like immediately just like basically handcuffed my partner to the <laughs> kitchen table and I was like we're doing this writing exercise <laughs> right now and I was like don't worry it's gonna be really hot I think that's probably how non-writers imagine we all are in our marriages where it's like sit down we're doing a writing exercise <laughs> tell me about your sexual life story <laughs> Totally. And basically, you know, he's not a writer who's like, all right, I guess this is what life is now. <laughs> your, your ability, Melissa, to write. And, and, and can I mention girlhood? I guess I just did. I mean, I mean, writing about the sexual shame that you enter into as, as, uh, as a girl, you know, you're such a bold little uh, human and then you go through you develop this libido and suddenly horrible things start happening i mean truly scalding events begin to chase you yeah. around that. and what i love about how you write about it is there's no how did did you have to write a bunch of stuff where you had ideas about that and throw that away. Can you, it, I'm thinking about the very early thing with the guy on the bus. Yeah, it, yeah. Was, was there a version of that where you wrote ideas about assault and abuse and? Yeah, yeah. So Mary's talking about an essay. It's the, it's the first full length essay in Girlhood and it's about this um, experience I had with a neighbor when I was an adolescent where it was a really horrible episode of bullying. And you know what, it's just like amazingly, I truly said many times and thought to myself many times for my whole life after that, I was never bullied. I'm so lucky that I was never bullied. Just like truly just like wiped the whiteboard of my mind and was like, that wasn't bullying, you know? And this is me after like 15 years of therapy, you know? Um, and then I, I actually just started writing about spitting about like spitting through the lens of my old job. And I was like, you know, it's weird that I was so into spitting. I wonder what that was about. And around the same time, I got this box of my old childhood journals from my mom's house. And I've been keeping journals since I was like eight, you know? And I was looking at my journal from that time and I found the entry about that neighbor. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. Like I got spat on at this like most vulnerable moment in my life. Um, and then I was like, holy shit, the power of the psyche to rewrite that which is indigestible. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm ready because this is, here we are. And so it really wasn't from an ideological standpoint at all. It was absolutely just like the past was like, <clears throat> and I was like, hello, <laughs> nobody's home. But it was like, <laughs> and that was it. Did it was you? Time. Did you just write it out? 
did you just write out the the events or did you did you not put a lot of crap around it no you know i i often put a lot of crap around it but with that one i really think i like avoided the topic for as long as i psychologically could and so when it was time it was just like fucking time you know it was like when i wrote my first book it was like this where i sort of avoided telling myself the truth about my own experience for so long that it just like broke out of me, you know? And so that essay, actually, there wasn't a lot of superfluous stuff. I really kind of just wrote through it. And I think I had to find, there's like an analogy and this is where the research, you know, it's like, I have to get little vacations from the personal stuff into the research. And I know both of you do this so beautifully. And I think that's why it reads organically with the research because I'm like, okay, let's read about the Titanic. Let's read about about spitting in Greek mythology. And I'm genuinely curious and I'm genuinely trying to figure it out through those things, but it gives me a little like break in from the emotional stuff. And then that actually becomes very organically like a part of it. So I pretty much just wrote my way through that one. Well, and I think it's also, I think the way you just put it is so right about kind of the way that these gazes towards something external, whether you know, researched or historical or um, the way you also, you know, ask other women about their lives and experiences in these powerful ways that it's like, I think a reader can feel the difference between that happening as a kind of diversion that points away from the, the, the deep hot pulsing course, core or something that is just helping you understand the thing better so that you come back into experience yeah. on this other level. But it's like yeah. that kind of boomeranging of coming back inside yeah. is really- Yeah, because there are usually hiding places in the first drafts. Like there's so much research that's not in the essay that I was just procrastinating reading academic articles or what, you know, talking about it with people and just avoiding it. And that stuff doesn't make it in, you know? And it's one of the reasons why like, you know, I started my MFA in fiction and sometimes I write fiction occasionally, but people always ask me like, oh, are you going to finish your novel? And maybe I will, but also it's like, there's too many hiding places. In fiction, there's so many hiding places that I'm constantly having to like hunt myself down and pull myself out of some little hiding place to get back to like the emotionally true part of the story. So it takes me forever. <laughs> do, do, do either of you, I want to ask both of you this question, do either of you ever have students because I, I have, and I'm friends with, Delillo is a great fiction writer. And when I talked to him once about writing a memoir, he recoiled like I had thrown like salt on a slug or something. <laughs> but, but do either of you ever find a student, because I have had these students that tell greater truths in fiction, that just the form of fiction is more their form and, yep. and they're avoidant in, in, uh, in nonfiction and true in fiction? Absolutely. I feel like a lot of my friends too, a lot of my friends are fiction writers and they feel about fiction the way I feel about nonfiction, that it is just the form, the constrictions of the form hold me steady so that I can face myself. And they feel the same way about the expansiveness of fiction gives them enough space to chase down whatever the thing is that they need to be saying, right? When I think there's something even kind of within whatever form you're working in, there can actually be something really energizing about like the finding of oneself happening through and in the text rather than just kind of like fast forwarding to like the truth or the insight, right? To somehow dramatize like what it takes to get there. And even how you were just describing it, Melissa, like, you know, kind of finding these hiding places and then finding yourself in them. It, it makes me think about the, the Winnicott that you quoted and, and the way in which there is an actually a kind of energy and delight in somehow illuminating, oh, here are the mechanisms by which I try to avoid myself and, and watch me just like punch right through them and get to that like fifth sentence in the five sentence autobiography where the thing that was in there all along, but you couldn't say or couldn't face is like mm -hmm. coming right out. And um, mm -hmm. I was, I know that we have like a many, many many questions from the many, oh God, many we do. Lots of people are here but I wanted to ask you about um I mean I have a thousand questions but I I wanted to ask you a little bit about I loved um a big shitty party which is the chapter I loved your whole book but the chapter about uh writing about other people which I'm sure you guys get just you know a, a million times a minute the there. <laughs> other people about writing about other people writing the personal how do you navigate that and I love that you just like gave us this chapter 
after that we can just draw on your wisdom around that question. Um, but one of the things you write about is kind of navigating being a, a pleaser in life who never wants to make people unhappy. And I'm not just not to say that is you, but that's like a wrestling, right? And how I and how that how you kind of brought yourself to writing writing that you knew wouldn't please everyone. And I guess my question is, if you could talk a little bit, and I would love to hear both of you talk about it because I ask you about it in life, but I can ask you about it right here. It's like, how do you kind of navigate, okay, I'm not gonna be a pleaser in my work. I know that it's sometimes gonna make people unhappy. That on the one hand, and also genuinely thinking about wanting to do right by people in the work on the other hand and how to let neither one of those become sort of push the other one out of you. Oh, I mean, honestly, like, and I think I say this in body work, I could write a book about this, which would is like my worst nightmare. I think I quote Mary in the notes when I say that about like a shit eating contest or something. Um, but, um, but I have, few things have grown me more than my experiences in this area. And just like, you know, like all of the most important lessons I've learned, I've learned them the hard way by sort of crossing my own boundaries and other people's boundaries. And um, it is not the combination I thought it was. Like the, the sort of path that I have found to walk is one of both sort of honoring the integrity of my own art and also honoring the relationships in my life and treating them with care and with bravery, right? Like trying to have the conversation with the person before I write about it and sort of like come in the back door of telling the truth, um, showing things to people and having hard conversations. Um, and I've just like figured out some guidelines for myself that I really think every writer has to come to on their own. Like for me, um, I won't write about something ever again that was bigger in someone else's life than it was in mine without their permission. Like, I just won't ever do it. And, you know, probably with anyone, but particularly with anyone that I have an active relationship with, you know. Can you give me, can you give me an example of what that would be? I just mean like writing about someone else's trauma or their abuse or something like that. Like, even if I'm telling my own story of like being peripheral to that, like I would want to make sure that I felt right about it and that if they're living and I have a relationship with them that they feel like they've been included in that process in some way. Um, and also just like on the other side, like not, not needing permission, you know, like basically everything I've ever written not all of them actually, but some of the hardest ones that implicate other people. The first version is always the version that I tried to write that nobody would be mad at me. And sometimes they made no sense. Like they were literally incomprehensible. <laughs> like I remember showing an early version of Abandon Me to a friend of mine and she was like, this literally does not make sense. There's no reason, you, there's no motive for the characters doing the things they do because you left out everything that would upset anyone. Like it's like a corpse with no organs. Like what did you do, you know? Um, so, and so I don't know, Mary, the, the amazing things you did, Melissa, I think you froze. Oh no. Oh no. Melissa, come back. I can see Melissa. you. Hold on. I'm texting Melissa. Am I back yet? Yeah, I think, I think it might be, Ma I think it might be Mary who's frozen. Oh, it's Mary who's frozen. Okay. I think she, hopefully she'll come back. Well, Leslie, what do you do? Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, I, 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 so much of how you write about it and talk about it really resonates with me, which is why I think that was such a meaningful part of the book. I mean, and I totally agree with like learning, learning things the hard way, coming up with a particular set of rules rather than things that could apply to anyone. And yeah, I mean, some of the ones that have been important to me are like in almost all cases, although probably not all cases, I, yeah, I try to share, um, a draft of the the piece of writing with whoever appears in it, like really um, not just beforehand, but well enough beforehand that we have time to talk about it and have even arrived at that language of like, I'd love to have a, if you're up for reading this rather than like assuming that they want to read it and like, right. I'd love to have a conversation about it and edit from that conversation, which is of course different from saying, I'd love to 
to hear your thoughts and then in fact, implement all of them, <laughs> you know, which is like also all these things I learned by saying like, you know, anything that bothers you, my first impulse, probably the first time I did that, I was like, anything that bothers you is gone, you know? And then I was like, realized, no, that's actually not what I mean and not what I'm willing to offer. So why don't I just not say that? Yeah. Um, How yeah. have, for the most part, I have to say, and this is like, I don't know, is not something that can be guaranteed, but I think like, I would definitely not have written the things I've written or, you know, obviously be the person I am today if not for my family. But one of the, the many ways that I've been supported by my family and really enjoyed sort of the privilege of their support is that my family has been willing to show up for those conversations with me, you know? Um, and it hasn't always been easy. You know what I mean? Like we, you and I and Mary too, uh, write about things that like families don't need to know about their daughters. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that like, they probably don't want to know and having to navigate those conversations is not easy and it's a lot to ask. And like my family, particularly my mom has really shown up for those conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like seen and loved through it. And it is one of the sort of healing ways that this kind of work has manifested in my life that was not part of my plan. Um, but it has been healing not only to me, but in my relationships to sort of be seen, to have people be mad at me, to have to apologize, like all of it. I, I'm so glad for those experiences, even though I never would have chosen them if I didn't have to because of my work. Mary. Hey, Mary, you're back. I got fired. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the amazing, the ama one of the amazing moments, <laughs> pardon me, Bless you. is writing about the boy who, who spit on you. Yep. And, um, and that at one point, I, can I say what happens or am I like screwing something up? No, I think it's fine. A at one point when you finally sort of burst into tears when this has been uh, going on for a while. And he says, I thought you knew I did it because I liked you. <laughs> it's just like, like, instead of you perceived having this power, or rather you assigned to him this power, or rather the culture gave him the power, the structures of our culture gave him the power. Mm -hmm. And when his, you, you made such psychological and moral and emotional and political complexity uh with telling all of that story instead of just having it be um do you know what i'm saying i do yeah it, i mean i think that's the thing is like i have to get was it hard for you to do that was it hard for you to say that or how did you come to that yeah i mean i think it's the product of like decades right like it took my whole life to write most of the things that i've written like i could not have done it a moment sooner right and it's and I couldn't be seen in those thinking processes um, if I hadn't been through the process of writing about it, which is for me, the process of integration and the process of really sort of making friends with an experience that I felt threatened by, you know? Um, I, we have 11 minutes before we, have, before we get kicked out of the Zoom. I just so, opened up the Q&A. Are you thinking maybe we can take, there's some I, great questions. Maybe we can, I think maybe we can take like one. Because <laughs> um, uh, I want to hear your answers to it too. Well, I think we, we need to start with your answers because it's what we're here for tonight. But it's so fun to just be thinking of talking together. There's so many. I feel many like I could talk. I mean, we could talk for like, Mary said at the beginning that we should maybe do like a longer thing or a seminar together or something. And I think that we, we should, should do, we like, should do an online memoir seminar. We could that, talk that so people long. could sign for and we could structure because the three of us have a very complicated, deep, serious, uh, caring, loving relationship around our, each other and our work. And I think that could be really magic. It would be transparent. Do you I'm see down. what's happening in the chat right now? People are going bananas. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do it. It's done. It's happening. All right. We're, we'll do it. More to come. More to come. Okay. Yeah. Meg, well, here's one great question. There's so many. This is just one that caught my eye. Megan wonders, 
what's your advice for writers who feel or are told by their trolls, inner or outer, that their story is too small, meaning not enough big, traumatic, dramatic storyline? Mm -hmm. I mean, here's what I will say, and this is really common too. It's like, and I think also sometimes when it's, when they're talking to me, people are like, but I wasn't a dominatrix, you know, or like I didn't recover from addiction. Um, and, and they think that you have to have exotic experience in order to be interesting to other people. Like you have to come from a long line of, you know, circus performers or compulsive gamblers or whatever. Um, and what I tell them is that my favorite part of reading, like the best feeling for me is not when I'm like dazzled by how exotic something is. It's never that. It's always recognition. It's always the moment when I read a writer articulating something that I have just never had the objectivity to think about in words or that I've been afraid to say when it just like clicks exactly into something inside of me. And my students always know exactly what that feels like because it's their favorite part too. It's like being seen by someone across space and time in a work of art. Like that's what I read for. It has nothing to do with like the circus performing or the dominatrixing or any of that stuff, right? And so it's, it's, it's less, the story is just a vehicle for naming the things that we all have inside of us, right? And you can do that, like, it, it's the most mundane descriptions of life events that have the most profound articulations about human existence, right? I mean, what do you think? How you cut a piece of melon. I was going to say, uh, there's a wonderful question there about what do you do if you have a family member who just says, no, you can't, you can't write about this. And I have an answer, but I want to hear y'all's answer. I want to hear your answer, Mary. <laughs> well, when I was younger, I would have uh, been more thwarted by it. Now I just say, write your own damn book. <laughs> I'm, I'm old and mean now. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm working on a book about my sister's death, really. And I just had um, her husband kind of uh, throw, a, throw a fit at me around the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just like, okay, well, then I just won't talk to you anymore. That's fine yeah. with me. Sorry, sister Trump's husband in this case. <laughs> I mean, I would have to say it has to do with who it is. Like who's saying it, you know what I mean? And I think like, if it's someone I love whose relationship is precious to me and it's theirs in some way, I would think about it really seriously, you know? And if it's someone, if that's not the case, like in your case, Mary, write your own damn book, you know? Especially if it's really mine, like if it's really my story, it would be hard, you know? Because I think I, I mostly write the things I have to. And so it would have to be a really compelling counter argument, you know, details, elements, sure, you know, but like my stories. Right. Somebody's big greatest secret that, as you say, has a greater consequence to them right. than to you. It's exactly. not really something that's part of how you chose, how you came to define yourself and therefore is not part of your narrative. Exactly. It's not, right. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, you know, and I think what's great about both of your responses to that question, which is also a great question, is just that somebody saying no isn't the end of the process. Like, then you get to have a process where you think about what they're saying and what you want to do with it, but it's not like the saying of that is sort of the end of the story or the closing of the book. And also, sometimes people have a really big, this goes for a lot of things besides just being written about, sometimes people have a really big reaction and the the moment of their reaction isn't forever. It's like a moment of reaction. And sometimes there's some discomfort and some really hard conversations. I loved how you talked about some of those hard conversations, Melissa, but also that like, there's a way that those hard conversations aren't always just damage being done to a relationship from which it has to recover. Like sometimes right. they're actually transforming the right. relationship. And Something that as much about that, I think, as- It's as true. Can. Yeah. One of the ways that I have come to understand like true love, and I don't mean just romantic 
like sexual love, but like true love with my friends and many of my family members. And I've seen a lot of their names uh, in here tonight. These those like true loves, like the relationships of my heart. Are there people that I have had conflict with where we have disappointed each other or like disagreed about things and we have like continued to love each other through whatever that process was? Like that is what, it's not an absence of conflict, but like the resilience and survival and growth out of conflict that makes for good intimacy, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm so avoidant of conflict that writing is something that has deepened all of my important relationships because otherwise I would have avoided it. And now I know that we can love each other through that experience, whatever it is, you know? And that Really is beautiful, Melissa. You're, you're, you guys, you're really teaching me, preach. Yeah, I was going to say, listening to you talk about conflict, Melissa, it's like going to church. I mean, I'm just like, oh, God, this is what I need to hear because it's so true. And even, I mean, both of you have taught me so much about discomfort, but it's like what happens in those places that can't happen anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's what we're all doing, right? Like we're just, we do this because we couldn't start the conversation any other way. <laughs> you know, like I really could not say aloud any of this stuff until I wrote it. And then people were like, what is this? And I was like, okay, I guess I'll talk about it. <laughs> oh, I think we're basically out of time. And I just want to say, I love you both from the bottom of my heart. You have taught me so much. And I will read anything that you ever write. I am so excited for all of the art that, that you have yet to make. I love, I love, I love, Very you muted. love this book. And I also think like, let's save, I hope we can get the transcript of the, all these I know I want to see the chat. And the chat, because I feel like if we ever do do this thing, we should just start with these 29 unanswered questions that are all so good. And because there's so much, um, but um, Mary and Melissa, you guys are true, true legends, deep inspirations to me. Melissa, this book is so good. I'm so glad it's in the world. Like Mary, I'm ready to thrust it on all of my students. It's really a gift. It's a gift to all That's of right. us. It's a great shortcut for anybody uh, trying to develop some uh, courage and also some beautiful language on the page. Thank you, and Mary. some healing, and some healing. <laughs>